with teachers, students, and friends. I'm delighted to be here at Hotong Institution this morning to speak to you. It's my first time here in the school. I've been to the JC before, but not to the secondary school. Your principal reminded me that I had been invited before, <laughs> but because of my uh, traveling schedule, I had not been able to come earlier. I was very impressed by the drumming reception that I received downstairs, 24 drums marking the 24 segments in the year. And to be greeted by the statue of your founder, Tankaki. He's a great man, a man who did big things. Recently, I visited North Korea and traveled by road from Pyongyang to China. We crossed the Yalu River to the Liaoning city of Tangtong. And at Tangtong, I visited a wonderful museum built by the Chinese government to the Korean War. And it gave me a different perspective of the war. I read about it from the American side. This time, I was able to appreciate it from the Chinese side. And there was an exhibit where they paid tribute to overseas Chinese who aided China in their effort. And it included your founder, Tankaki. I was moved by this and posed for a picture against his portrait in order to send it to one of his grandsons whom I know in Singapore. You belong to a proud tradition and that tradition is not only an asset for you, it is a guide to your future. When I was asked whether I could speak on the topic opportunities and challenges in the new regional realities some weeks ago, I looked at it. I didn't quite know what I was going to talk to you about, but I thought it was a topic large enough to contain whatever I want to say. I thought I should not dwell on the details of foreign policy because I've already spoken too much on it, and it would not be very new or interesting to you. But putting myself in your position, I thought I addressed three questions, which everyone has to answer in the course of his life. Who am I? Why am I here? What do I want to be? Who am I? Why am I here? And what do I want to be? I've just finished reading a book written by Barack Obama over 10 years ago. When he was a young man, very keen to discover his roots. As you know, his father was a Kenyan who married a white American woman in Hawaii. But they divorced not long after Barack was born. And as he grew up, he heard stories about his father from his mother and his mother's parents. And some years later, his father visited him in Hawaii, but it was an awkward meeting. And he confessed that he was a little relieved when the father left because his arrival created tensions in the family environment. But it always been a question mark in him what his roots were. Eventually, he found his way back to Kenya, where he met his relatives, where he saw where his forefathers had come from. You see, his father had two white American wives, 
and I believe three African wives, and the children by all of them. So he met his, his aunts and uncles and grand aunts and his many cousins. And sometimes in curious ways, seeing his own gene pool in Africa. The reason why I read Obama is because if you check the electronic bets on the internet, either in trade or the Iowa electronic markets, the odds on Obama winning are 60 percent, McCain 30 plus percent. But this is of now, and it's, it's still many months before, before the elections. But I thought since if we have a new US president and it's Barack Obama, we've got to know what that may mean for us here in Singapore. Reading his book, I was reminded of my own voyage of, dis of discovery about where my parents came from. My mother was born in China from Teochew, and when my grandfather died, my father went from Singapore back to China in 1937 for the funeral. And under local custom, you either marry within 100 days or you wait three years. My father couldn't wait and married my mother. Then the Japanese invaded China, the Gou Tiao, 7737, and they hurried back to the Nanyang. My mom was a bride of 19 years old. She was the eldest daughter. She couldn't go back to see her parents till 1978, when Deng Xiaoping reopened China to the world. She went back as a grandmother, and at that time, her parents were in the late 80s, early 90s. The first thing she did was to kneel before them, almost an apology to the long years of separation. But of course, they were very happy to see her. And then they went back every year. In 1983, I decided to follow them to see my grandparents was still alive in the 90s at that time. I was a major half colonel in the armed forces. And at that time, on our passports, because of the communist threat, we could not visit China. Four countries we could not visit. North Vietnam, China, North Korea, Cuba, some, something like that. So I made my application. And before I went, ISD called me up for an interview. He wanted to know why I was interested to go to China. One hour, very polite, they gave me a bottle of Coca-Cola <laughs> and said, when I come back, can they interview me again? So that they have a sense of how Singaporeans, young Singaporeans reacted in a new situation to a new China. Two weeks later, I came back. So I waited a few days before I contacted ISD. But before I could contact them, they contacted me and said, you're back now. Can we debrief you? I said, of course. So I went down. Another hour, another bottle of Coca-Cola. Because at that time, the Singapore government was reviewing its policy on travel to China. I spent a week in the village, which was a different world for me because the entire community there was desperately poor. No electricity except for one light bulb, which went brown in the evening. No latrines, so I had to do my business outside, which was an adventure. And nothing was wasted because eventually all that went to the ponds to feed the carp and so on. Or the pigs. <laughs> 